Cocoa Beach is your ultimate Florida beach vacation. Pack your bags and open your mind. Adventure is calling from Orlando's closest beach. Cocoa Beach is Florida's secret gem that's got it all. It's the budget-friendly, retro-cool destination that families and surfers adore. Come soak up the sun and ride the East Coast's most famous waves. Start planning your one-of-a-kind getaway now at visitspacecoast.com. That's visitspacecoast.com. Hello and welcome to History for Weirdos. We are your hosts, Andrew and Stephanie. And each week, we're going to take you on a journey into the strange, obscure, and relentlessly entertaining corners of human history. Now listen up, friends, because it's about to get weird. back with episode number 76 of History for Weirdos. Welcome back, weirdos. And if you're a fan of NFL football and you're a Chiefs fan, congratulations. If you're an Eagles fan, I'm sorry. And if you're like us and you didn't really care either way, well, happy Monday. Happy Monday. And if you're listening to this, the day it comes out, happy early Valentine's Day because tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Y- yes. Happy early Valentine's Day. And you know what? That's really interesting. You bring up Valentine's Day. Why? Because my episode is not necessarily about Valentine's Day, but it is a love story. Ooh, that's perfect timing. I thought you were going to ask me to be your Valentine. Well, I thought that was implied. Ooh, no, no. Oh, that's like, that's a mistake. Big mistake right there, weirdos. We're embarrassed for you. I know. I'm, em- I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> Well, you, do you, you want to be my Valentine? Um, I'll think about it. Okay, cool. I'm gonna think. Let's see how good this episode is. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm not, I'm not I'm not about to cry or anything. Okay, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> let's see how the episode is, and then I'll tell you. Yes, and weirdos. I know we did an episode on Valentine's Day actually, like years back, about the history of it. I think it was mm-hmm. like it was within the first twenty episodes. And I'm so sorry. I should have probably written that down in my notes beforehand, but I didn't. So if you want, you can go check that out as well yeah, after you, can... you listen to this one, of course. Exactly. You can go back into our old episodes and learn about the history of Valentine's Day. I think I covered that one. You did, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it goes back to ancient Rome. Because, mm-hmm. of course, everything does. Anyways, okay. But this week's episode. So, boy, oh boy, do I, got, do I just have a story for you all. It's going to be a good one. The story is just absolutely wild. It's characterized by passion, intrigue, mystery, jealousy, and even murder. Wow, that sounds like a good story. Yeah, it has everything. This is the medieval love story between Peter or Pedro, the first of Portugal, and Inez de Castro. Have you ever heard of this, by the way? I've never heard of either of those people. Yeah, I actually had not heard of this story before, but apparently in Portugal, this is like a really well-known love story. It's like almost their version of Romeo and Juliet. Oh, wow. If there are any um, Portuguese or Portuguese-American, Portuguese-descent weirdos out there, please let us know yes. if you've heard this story before. That's so cool. Yeah, I'm really curious because I, I had never heard of it before I started researching it. So, in the present day, you can go to the Monastery of Alcobasa. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site that is just absolutely stunning. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's in Portugal, obviously. And... We'll post a picture of it on our Instagram uh, for this episode. So if you're so inclined, you can go view it. And shameless plug to follow us on Instagram if you have not done so. And it's actually considered the one of the seven wonders of Portugal with its gothic beauty. Um, And it homes many of the remains of the royal uh, family of Portugal. Okay. Yeah. I'm assuming this connects to your story. It does. Okay. It does. (laughs) So it's, and it, again, like this monastery is very similar to how like Westminster Abbey is the home to the remains of like a lot of the royal family of the, the English throne. Yes. So two of the tombs in the monastery of Alcobasa belong to our protagonists, Peter and Innes. Ooh. And we'll get back to it later on. But I just wanted to like plant that seed in all of your minds. Okay. So that's where our story ends. But where does it all begin? So here's the thing. I'm going to focus our narrative more on Peter in the beginning uh, because not only would he become king, uh, but Ur- his early life is much better documented than yeah. Inez's. That makes sense if he was going to be king. Exactly. Mm-hmm. 
And she was a noble woman, but not like in line to be queen or anything like that. Okay. So minor spoilers, but the how and why is more intriguing than the what in the instance of of Peter outliving Inez. Okay. So we know that happens. We know this happens, but it's... The how and the why is where... That's where like the intriguing part okay. of this is. So Peter I was born on April 8th, 1320 to Afonso IV of Portugal and Beatrice of Castile. Mm-hmm. So Castile was a Spanish kingdom before the unification um, of Spain during the following century. Okay. And fun fact, there's actually an autonomous community in Spain to this in, in the present day called Castile and Leon or Castilla y Leon in Spanish. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Is that why they say they speak Castilian? Yes, That's... Castilian Spanish is like the Spanish. Okay. Yeah, it's from Castile. Um, and by the way, like an autonomous community is like their version of a state. Mm-hmm. It's funny, they actually have provinces, but that really more is equivalent to like what we would call counties. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, I see the difference. Exactly, yeah. So by the time that Peter was only eight years old, he was already seeing his father like using his own children to secure alliances and being pawns already in international politics. Mm-hmm. So good, you know, good times. Peter's sister Maria was married to Alfonso the 11th of Castile. And so, by the way, there's going to be a lot of Alfonso and Alfonso. Alfonso was the father of Peter. Alfonso was the king of Castile. That's so interesting because I have family members named Alfonso, but I've never heard of anyone named Alfonso. I wonder if it's like, it's like a Portuguese equivalent. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's just the same name. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, and there's actually, this isn't going to be the only time in the story where like two like equivalents <laughs> have the same or very similar names. Okay, something to look forward yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. It just makes it even more confusing, more fun. So let's just say this. Alfonso liked to fool around mm-hmm. and this marriage just wouldn't last. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, what medieval monarch didn't fool, like to fool around? Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like it's almost a requirement. They definitely thought so. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're a monarch, you aren't having like affairs and or mistresses. Are you even a, a, like a European medieval monarch? No, definitely not. Definitely not. Right. <laughs> so anyways, Alfonso fell for a widowed noblewoman by the name of Eleanor de Guzman. And Maria eventually just gets over this whole thing and she bounces. Okay. She comes back to her father's court in Portugal and Alfonso is pissed. He was just not going to let this transgression slide against his daughter and probably against his own pride just slide. Yeah. So he had a brilliant idea. Why not marry his son, i.e. our protagonist Peter, off to Alfonso's uh, rival's daughter? Ooh. Yes. And the rival was a man by the name of Juan Manuel. He was the prince of Vienna. Not to be confused with Vienna, Austria. This is Vienna, like V-I-L-L-E-N-A. Okay. And oh, boy, oh boy, like Juan, like, oh yeah, sorry. Let me just mention something really quickly as well. Juan was also the cousin of Alfonso the Eleventh. Okay. So this is just, you know... So they're cousins and they're rivals. Exactly. That makes sense. Yeah, just classic medieval politics. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, this just straight up sounds like it's part of, like, a Mexican telenovela, doesn't it? It really does. I love (laughs) it so far. I mean, it it, it makes sense. It's from the Iberian Peninsula, so Mm -hmm. there you go. Peter was to marry the daughter, right, a woman by the name of Costanza. The English equivalent is Constance. Mm Mm-hmm. Constanza. Constanza. Okay. That's so much better because every time I read that, I just thought of the Seinfeld character. Yeah. That's exactly what it sounded yeah. like when you said it. What's his name? George. George Costanza is yeah. what it sounded like, but it's Constanza. Constanza. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah. That's much better. <laughs> You're good. Much better. So being the dutiful son, Peter accepted this proposal despite never having even seen Constanza. Let alone, like, talking to her or anything. Yeah, that's the role of a prince, I guess, right? He's never even seen what she looks like, though, Mm -hmm. which is wild. So they technically married in 1336 when Peter was 16. Oh, my gosh. But, again, it would be years before they even saw each other. Oh, 
Okay. Yeah, like this was due to fighting that was going on, like not only within Portugal, but like I think there was some fighting between like Portugal and Castile at this point. Like it's just like really complicated, and I didn't want to like bore you guys with details on this, so we're just gonna move on. So they got married without being in the same room. Yeah, without even being in the same country. Okay. That seems like that's not really getting married. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm like, they got married by proxy. And again, like, I didn't really... Oh, I have heard of that before. Yeah, like, yeah. I've heard of it too. I didn't research, it, like, how that happens. Because I'm yeah. like, it doesn't really matter. It's not really part of the story. Well, I mean, it is part of the story, but it's not an important part of the story. They're married, but they don't know each other. They exactly. They got married by proxy. Got it. And here, my beautiful weirdos and my even beautifuler Stephanie <laughs> is where we arrive at the inflection point of our story. So, in either 1339 or 1340, the sources differ, which is going to be a theme throughout this entire episode, which is, was really annoying, by the way, when I was researching this. I'm sure. But 1339 or 1340, we're going to go 1340 because I like that number better. Constanza finally arrived in Portugal. And Peter, Constanza, they see each other. Everything can be, like, hunky-dory, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the fates would have something else in mind. So within minutes or maybe possibly just like an hour or two after meeting his wife for the first time, despite being married for like four years, Peter meets her staff, including a certain lady in waiting. And instantly, like it was literally love at first sight. He was head over heels over this woman. And who was she? Inez de Castro. And in English, that's Agnes of Castro. But we're just going to go in this from now on. So from descriptions about her, we know that she had golden blonde hair, fair skin, and blue eyes. And this apparently just got Peter really going. He was madly in, in love. And I just can't repeat that enough. Wow. Like he was obsessed. From just seeing her. Yeah. Like the same day he meets his wife, he falls in love with Someone else he just met. Exactly. That's kind of a bummer. Part of her staff. <laughs> yeah, that's a bummer like, for um, Constanza. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She. So who was this woman? Who was Inez? She was the illegitimate daughter of Pedro Fernandez de Castro. He was a Galician nobleman and a prominent general. So okay. Galicia is just like the northwestern portion of Spain. Mm-hmm. And... She was tied, like, again, she was a noblewoman. She was tied to the royal families of Galicia, Castile, you know, through illegitimate means, and ironically enough, Portugal. Okay. So Peter, always the dutiful son and now the dutiful husband, did do the bare minimum with his new wife, including consummating the marriage and having children together even. Oh, wow. But that was about it. Mm -hmm. Like, he didn't want to, you know, be get to seen know with her. her. Yeah, get to know her, be seen with her in public or anything like that. Wow, that sucks. He was just like, okay, let's let's do this. And then that's about it. Okay. So let's get back to Peter and Inez, though. The juicy stuff. Their love was, like, leg literally legendary. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, according to one story, Peter would actually send her love letters through pipes so they wouldn't get intercepted. Wow. Yeah, kind of wild. They would like they often met in the gardens of Quinta das Lagrimas mm -hmm. for romantic dates, and you know so they can get away from prying eyes and spies. Mm -hmm. But their love affair was very was quickly found out, and it just threw things into like minor chaos. Yeah, L love is something that's hard to hide. Exactly, when you're in love. Yeah, because it would have been fine if she was just some peasant woman, mm -hmm. but she was a noble woman. So it's like oh, like. There's the possibility that, like, if they have children, they could claim the throne, right? But if oh. she was just some peasant mm -hmm. woman, it didn't matter. You think so? Yeah. Because kings had affairs with, like, ladies-in-waiting and stuff in other I countries, think, at least. Yeah, no, you're right. I think it was at this time with Portugal specifically. Oh, and because of all the tension and the fighting that's going on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So... Again, their love affair, it was found, and it, it threw things into, like, little chaotic instances. You know, there was the real possibility of war, not to mention that, you know, Alfonso's planet getting back at Alfonso for his <laughs> mistreatment of his daughter was completely backfiring now. Mm-hmm. Because now, like, his <laughs> son was, like, fooling around with this other woman. Yes. Like, so Juan Manuel is like, dude... 
what the hell? Yeah. So Peter's father was hoping that this was just some puppy love thing and eventually like it would fizzle out. So he wasn't super worried yet. Inez's brothers um, were not were also like invited to court and started to advise Peter. Oh. Yeah, so like, you know, he was kind of getting in with the family. This was a really big issue though because they were exiles from the Castilian court. Oh, oh okay. So it's just like it's just one thing after another. Do you know why they were exiles? I kids? don't know. I think they they stirred up like a little minor rebellion or something like yeah, that. Yeah. It must have to do something with their loyalty ties. It, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the court was just not pleased in general with this affair, right? And especially with Peter's alliances, or alliance, excuse me, with Ineas's siblings. Um, and, you know, chief amongst the people who weren't pleased with this was Afonso. Um, but, you know, he, again, he was willing to let this slide. He had legitimate children through, Pe- uh, grandchildren, excuse me, through Peter and Const- Constanza. So he was more or less fine with this affair carrying on for the time being. Like, he sounded like he was pretty reasonable, despite him not being super stoked on this, Mm -hmm. for lack of better terms. So, here comes the first attempt to sort of end this affair, and it's actually through Constanza. No. Yeah, she has a plan. Um, She asks Inez to be the godmother of her first child with her husband, you know, little Luis, uh, putting Inez in a tough spot. Because you see, if she accepts the proposal, that means she is officially part of the family and is essentially related to Peter through the church, making their relationship sacrilegious and incestuous. But if she refuses, it's like a slap in the face, and that would have massive ramifications. Yeah. And Ines is sort of driven into a corner here. So I'm going to ask you, Stephanie, <laughs> does that like does that kind of spot that Ines is being put in does does it remind you of anything, like maybe of a past episode? Um, Olga of Kiev? You got it. Yeah, with you... her marriage um, conversion situation there. Yes, yeah, you're right. It is very similar to Olga of Kiev refusing to marry the Eastern Roman Emperor of, Constanti- of Constantinople, excuse me, and instead having him baptize her. Yep. See, I remembered. You remembered. I know. I was trying to put you on the spot this time. And you've passed, unlike me. <laughs> Maybe it's because I understand the weird Catholic knowledge that goes goes into this. That's true, yeah. It also, I've told you this story before, but maybe the weirdos will think it's um, interesting, is it's similar to my abuela's story with her first love got my grandfather drunk and asked him if he could be the godfather of their child, um, the child they had just had. And my grandfather said yes, and they woke up the priest in the middle of the night, and they had a middle-of-the-night baptism because he wanted to always be a part of my abuela's family in some way. That's really sweet. Yeah. And kind of hilarious. Yes, it's (laughs) it's very fun. Like, my abuela tells the story very funny because they woke her, they woke the baby, they woke the priest... So they could have this midnight mass, basically. Oh my god, that's amazing. Kind of sweet, kind of romantic, kind of kooky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All It's a weirdo story. Yes, it's a little mini weirdo story. I love that. Well, thank you. Well, back to the plot. This plan, it completely backfires as Peter is just degaff about, you know, still hooking up with his mistress, despite her now being the godmother to one of his children. He literally couldn't care less. Okay. Um, and to make so he's very devout. He's very devout, <laughs> exactly. Um, just to make matters even more insane, Peter and Inez would end up having four children together, oh, with wow. three of them living to adulthood. Oh no! Yeah. So we kind of arrive at this at this point to a, a sad part of the story. Mm-hmm. So either in 1345 or in 1349, Constanza dies. Okay. So, officially, she dies in 1345 when giving birth to her and Peter's son, Ferdinand. Mm -hmm. But there is an account of her living for a few more years and actually dying giving birth to a daughter. uh, I think her name was Maria, who would only live for a few days. Oh, wow. So, either way, it sounds like she dies during childbirth or related to childbirth. Exactly. Mm. And what's a little concerning from my perspective, um, at least... Uh, publicly uh, 
is that Peter doesn't seem to be affected by her passing. Oof. That's not a good look. Yeah, I'm like... Your I, wife, I, the mother of your children. Exactly. It's mm-hmm. like, bro, I get that like you're in love with someone else, but this is your lawfully wed wife. Like, Can't you just at least pretend? Yeah, you'd think he could pretend. <laughs> right. Just be respectful. Yeah, seriously. This also a little bit reminds me um, loosely of when Henry VIII fell in love with Anne Boleyn. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that was sad too. That was really sad. The whole situation with his his Spanish wife. Right. She was super sad and he banishes her. (laughs) I know. (laughs) And she's just like existing during the affair. Can't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a sad situation for Constanza. It is. You know, either way, like whether she died in 1345 or 1349, it doesn't really matter because this opened up a door. Mm Mm-hmm. That door being Peter's ability to marry Inez and right. make their relationship official. Right. Immediately, Afonso... Um, ban- his dad. Yeah, his right. father, yeah. Banishes Inez from court. And guess what Peter did? Does he follow her? He ran off with her. Ay, yeah, ay, yeah, ay, yeah. <laughs> <They, laughs> so predictable. I know, right? <laughs> they settled in Santa Clara of Valha. I don't wow. Know. Yeah. Uh, located in the southernmost portion of Portugal and essentially lived as husband and wife. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, according to legend, Peter eventually took Inez as his wife in 1354 in the city of Baragansa, which scandalized everyone. That is quite scandalous. Very scandalous. (laughs) And I say according to legend because there is no documentation that this actually happened. Oh, interesting. And we'll speak more about this in a little bit. Mm. But during this time, though, um, Afonso did make efforts to sort of meet Peter in the middle. Okay, how so? So he gathered a list of multiple princesses that he could marry. <laughs> no! And essentially was like, my dude, pick one, anyone. There's like literally like a dozen here. You can have your, your pick. Like, just pick one of them. Because like... After all, marriage at this time was an important strategic yeah. decision. It is not one made from love. Like, how silly yeah. to marry someone you love at this point when you're a monarch or a monarch in waiting, basically. It's a political move. It's absolutely a political move. And Peter, of course, was just not about any of these women and instead was just dead set with being with Inez. I mean, him and Inez have been together for years at this point, Yeah, it sounds like. So it's almost silly that the dad thinks that this, you know, will pass or that he can just give him another wife to keep him happy. They seem to be very dedicated to each other. Exactly. And like they must have been married for like at this point like roughly like or married together for like at least 10 years. Yeah, and this would have been really like looked down upon obviously in like the yeah. Catholic Church and their culture things like that and they are still willing to be together and have these illegitimate children like this is not a phase. Right, exactly. This isn't puppy love. This isn't puppy love. And I should also mention that during this time, Inez's brothers were getting a little even more brazen. Uh-oh. Yeah. They suggested that Peter should be the king of Castile. Why not? Yeah, why not, right? <laughs> it, it wasn't entirely an absurd premise since mm-hmm. his maternal grandfather was indeed the king of Castile back in the day. So he had a claim. Yeah, I think his name was Sancho. Sancho is... Actually, I, I'm pretty sure it's what you call someone who is the person that you're being cuckled with. Oh my God! There's a Sublime song about that. Yes, it's like if 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 you are a, a male and your woman is cheating on you, that dude is called Sancho. And yes, there is a Sublime song. You're right. Yeah. So that's a that's funny that that was just this dude's name. <laughs> it was just like some dude in like the early like like. 14th century probably actually probably late 13th century well those um you know nicknames or sayings phrases come from i always think like who was the who was the dude that this originally came from right who was sancho so maybe it was this guy it could have been yeah yeah well yeah so that's an interesting take actually yeah very interesting so here's the thing here's what's kind of crazy about this is that like the court 
is not happy about this, right? You'd think that like, oh, like, you know, maybe add Castile to Portugal's domain, but Okay, yeah. Like no one no one wanted that because that would just create war. And there, this we at this point we've had like years of peace. Mm-hmm. And so no one wanted to go to like over to war over some dynastic like struggle. Right. Especially when there wasn't going to be a clear winner. So just to make matters even worse from the eye, like at least from the eyes of Afonso, Peter's father, Peter's illegitimate children were much healthier than Peter's sickly legitimate son, Ferdinand. No, poor Ferdinand. Yeah. Fearing that a family squabble over the throne might throw the entire country into civil war, like Afonso at this point has kind of hit his breaking point. Yeah. And on January 7th, 1355, Peter left for a hunting trip. Okay. Afonso ordered three of his advisors, Pero Coelho, Alvaro Gonsalves, and Diojo Lopez Pacheco, to take care of Inez. Oh no! They traveled to Santa Clara Alvelha and decapitated <gasps> her in front of her children. Oh my god! Yes. Oh my god! They didn't even do it discreetly? No, in front of her children. And that's so violent. Like, while Peter was out. Oh, my God. Poor Inez. And according to legend, or excuse me, Afonso was actually with the men. (gasps) And he almost called it all off, um, but at the last minute decided to go uh, through with it by telling the assassins as he was leaving the room, do whatever you want. So he left it up to them. Basically, yeah. He was kind of split. I don't know what to do. Ah, you guys pick. But they're assassins, so So, they're going to pick to assassinate. Yeah, exactly. So Peter comes back, and to say that he was enraged is probably a vast understatement. He just went absolutely berserk and immediately started a civil war against his own father. Oh, wow. He was not messing around. The war didn't last very long, because, you know, um, Afonso was a gifted military, like, genius. Okay. So, you know, he's, and he probably has the upper hand. He probably has, like, the better he's the army and everything. King he's at the this actual point. king. Yes. Yeah. Peter, um, like, a few months into it, Peter was actually besieging the town of Porto when his mother finally stepped <laughs> oh, in no. and intervened. It's so embarrassing. Yeah. We, we don't know what was said, but it was enough. Uh, for father and son to finally, like, reunite and, like, bury the hatchet. Oh, my gosh, of course. Mom <laughs> and, has to come in and make the peace. And again, yeah, it was probably a good thing for Peter because he was losing. Yeah, I'm sure it was out of um, mercy exactly. on the mom's part. I definitely think so. But it didn't really matter because within two years, Afonso dies and Peter is now king of Portugal. Wow. Yeah. What a challenging relationship those two had. I know. And... He, Peter would actually go on to have some important reformations and would be known as Peter the Just because of his commitment to justice. But we're not here to talk about that. Yeah, what's the good stuff? So we're, we're here to talk <laughs> about the juicy stuff. And, you know, why don't we talk about one of his acts of dispensing justice? Yeah, how did he dispense justice? Well, let's talk about the three assassins that killed Inez. Remember, there's Pedro Coelho... Alvaro Gonsalves and Diojo Lopez Pacheco. Remember them, right? Yes. So they had fled from Cast or they had fled to Castile, excuse me, fearing for their lives, which was probably a smart move on their part. Uh, what they didn't know is that Peter's cousin, also named Peter, of course, was surprisingly <laughs> on good terms with Portuguese Peter, and this and Castilian Peter <laughs> was the king of Castile at this time. Okay. So they conducted a sort of like fugitive exchange and Castilian Peter, he was ended up being nicknamed Peter the Cruel, by the way. Okay. Yeah, he handed, (laughs) that's just more of a fun fact, not really important to the story. Hopefully it was an ironic nickname. It was not. (laughs) Um, He handed over the three men. Okay. But, you know, somehow, some way, Diojo Lopez Pacheco somehow escaped to France. Oh. And he would eventually die in 1383. Um, So he escaped. The other two were not as fortunate, though. So in a public trial in 1361, Pero Coelho and Alvaro Gonsalves were convicted of murder and sentenced to death. 
But how they died is why you're hearing the story. Uh, Peter felt just beyond heartbroken that Inez was taken from him, and he wanted to dish out a punishment that fit the crime. So according to one story, he personally ripped out both of their hearts with his own hands. Oh my God. Uh, One was from the front and the other one was from the back. (gasps) Peter wasn't playing. Another story has him eating dinner and having their hearts being ripped out in front of him while he's eating. He was dramatic. (laughs) Dude, he really had that, that Latin flair. He was a fire sign or something. Yeah, he really did. I kind of respect it, but also terrified. Yes. Yeah. Very poetic justice, I guess. I know. He t- he. Apparently, he said something to the lines of, like, you broke my heart, so now I'll take yours. Wow. <laughs> I know. It's wild. Straight out of a telenovela, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Inez's death was now mostly avenged. And, he, again, he would unfortunately never find Pacheco, but he still had some unfinished business with Inez and her status. Okay. Because um, remember, you know, how I said to remember, like, his wedding with Inez? Yeah. So this is why. Like, one apocryphal story is that, um, like, he wanted Inez to be recognized as queen. Uh-huh. As the queen, as his wife. Yeah. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so Peter had Inez's body exhumed. And he conducted a ceremony officially naming her as queen. Um, In the story, he had her sit on a throne and had court officials, like like the entire court basically, come bow in front, like, you know, to her corpse and even kiss her hand, showing signs of fealty. Oh, no. That's very Norman Bates of him. Yeah. I I do want to mention, though, that this is, like, popular folklore and most likely did not happen but again i had to mention it yeah because that's so interesting at the very least that his mm, grief his pain his passion whatever was so intense that even that people could think of this story right. you know what i mean that they had this impression of him exactly that he was almost mad with grief exactly exactly um but we do know that Aeneas's body was indeed exhumed. Um, that is for sure. That did happen. Uh, but what ended up actually, like, probably transpiring is that it was it, it was taken to a monastery or the monastery, excuse me, of Alcobasa to be reburied in a tomb there. Okay, so yeah, like where the royal bodies are. Mm-hmm. And this procession apparently was just extravagant, with at least a thousand candles lighting like the flanks of her caravan i hope you do the same for me (laughs) if i pass away first i want literally nothing less okay i'll make sure that happens take notes from peter (laughs) yeah and i guess the weirdos are gonna hold me to it yes (laughs) so one chronicler like who had seen this remarked that quote inez de castro was led to alcobasa between two lines of stars wow that's a beautiful image. Yeah, it must have been really cool. And I'm, and you know, obviously he thought very highly of her to give her such an extravagant burial. Yeah, he was uh, clearly obsessed with her. Yeah. So Peter also had an, another tomb built facing hers, where he would eventually be interned, so they could, you know, they're facing each other, so they could rise and see each other during the last judgment. Oh, now he's devout. I know, right? <laughs> it, now he's thinking about the the Bible and the sacraments I, exactly. and everything. It, it's sweet, but also kind of creepy. Yes. It's again, a little... Mm, again, he's very dramatic, very theatrical. Very theatrical indeed. Mm-hmm. So Peter would eventually die himself in 1367. And ironically, Afonso's fears eventually came to fruition. You know, Peter's son Ferdinand did take over as king, but he would die 16 years later in 1383, causing a two-year-long succession crisis Oof. that would end this dynasty. Wow. That's yeah. so sad. It's what's, kind, what's the most ironic, though, is that Peter's legitimate children and his illegitimate children with Inez, they, I think they... I didn't research a lot of this, so a lot of this is just kind of like cursory-looking... Um, 
like they they fought like stuff happened and who the person who would end up winning this entire struggle was the result of actually it was actually one of peter's children but it was like through a really brief affair possibly even a one night stand with this woman <gasps> and that guy would eventually start a whole new dynasty oh my god yeah so peter's child would eventually you know like would win this struggle but again like it wasn't like even a remotely legitimate child this sounds a lot like um <laughs> Like um, House of the Dragon. I know. It really does. I got embarrassed mentioning it. But it's a good show. <laughs> it is. And he, you know, George R. R. Martin takes a lot from history. Yeah. Um, but definitely sounds like this is Game of Thrones universe worthy. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. So we finally reached the end of our tale here. Um, both the tombs of Peter and Inez at the monastery of Akolbasa facing each other. On Peter's tomb, there's an inscription that reads, Ate o fim do mundo in Portuguese, or until the end of the world in English. Mm. And one last thing. So he's going to love her until the end of the world? Yeah, I think that's where they rise is. together. Wow, yeah. that's really beautiful. And last thing here, it, apparently, according to legend, if you walk the gardens of Quinta das Lagrimas, mm -hmm. which is really close to where this is and also that's where they had their dates really close yeah i remember that it's yeah. close to where they're buried it's really close to where they're buried and it's where they're yeah they had their dates some say that you can still hear the cries of inez calling out mm. for peter and even seeing you can even see peter's ghost searching for inez that's beautiful and spooky very very spooky and uh quinta das lagrimas yeah lagrimas is tears so yes that's perfect yeah it's like the estate of tears yeah it's kind of crazy, huh? Very fitting. So this legend also claims that her blood still stains the spring at the estate, causing the stone bed to look red. Whoa. Yeah. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the tragic tale of ill-fated love between Peter I of Portugal and Inez de Castro. Wow, that was so good. This would definitely be like... Um... Like a really good TV show or movie or novel. It's funny you say that. There was a movie made a few years ago. Oh, really? About this, yeah. It was a Portuguese movie. Oh, we should check it out, though. Yeah, I That's definitely so would cool. want to. It was actually, I looked up the premise. It was kind of crazy. It's this guy that can that's lived multiple lives. And this is like, there's one in the past, the present, and the future. And the one in the past is this. What? It, he's Peter. Yeah. Does he, is the premise that this person remembers his lives or it's just us witnessing? I have no idea. Okay. I'm... I just, I just saw that and I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool premise. And then I moved on. That sounds really interesting. I'm going to look it up. Yeah, definitely. So last things, uh, or last thing here, my sources, um, I used factinate.com, kind of a really cool website that broke down the story. Um, there was also one called, oh my God, I'm going to butcher this, La Bru. How do you say that? La Brujula Verde. La Brujula Verde? Yeah. Yes. There we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. La Bru yes. Brujula? Brujula. Mm -hmm. La Brujula Verde.com. There Perfect. we go. And then there was also the Algarve History Association. Mm, the Algarve, yeah. Yeah. Daily Art Magazine. And of course, our favorite Wikipedia. And of course... This just made me want to go on a trip to Portugal. I know. <laughs> and see things over there because it sounds beautiful. I know. I've only been to Lisbon and I loved it there. Oh, yes. I've only heard good things. And you just mentioned the Algarve. I've heard amazing things. Yes. Well, I think that's where the big waves are. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing this beautiful and tragic love story with us yes and i think this appeals to people who like and also hate valentine's day <laughs> because it's like yeah love cool for the people who love it and then it's also like oh yeah but your love dies tragically <laughs> at the hands of your father for the the haters as well oh my god <laughs> so it's it's a win-win for everyone here a little something for everyone absolutely <laughs> Well, weirdos, thank you for listening to another episode of History for Weirdos. Just another reminder, Andrew mentioned this earlier. If you do not already follow us on Instagram, follow us at History for Weirdos. And that's pretty much it, right? That's it. Until next time, weirdos. Until next time.
Cocoa Beach is your ultimate Florida beach vacation. Pack your bags and open your mind. Adventure is calling from Orlando's closest beach. Cocoa Beach is Florida's secret gem that's got it all. It's the budget-friendly, retro-cool destination that families and surfers adore. Come soak up the sun and ride the East Coast's most famous waves. Start planning your one-of-a-kind getaway now at visitspacecoast.com. That's visitspacecoast.com. We all know a guy who only occasionally shaves for big occasions, and it's because that occasional shave really hurts. It's the time of year for big occasions, and yet there he is, suffering with that cheap drugstore razor. Let's help him out. Henson Shaving's line of razors, built with aerospace precision, deliver a smooth shave your dad, brother, and even son can enjoy, eventually. With replacement blades just 10 cents each, you'll buy it once, and they'll use it for life. How's that for the perfect gift? Celebrate with 100 free blades on your first purchase, and no subscription headaches. HensonShaving.com slash holiday.